Okay, so the pressure's on, the uh, internet is down, and I'm the only entertainment you've got. Um, <laughs> I did leave the wireless on, though, so if the, if the internet comes up, I'm sure you'll, you'll see a signal up here. Um, so first I wanted to say uh, what an honor and a pleasure it is to be here to have the opportunity to talk at uh, Joe's uh, celebration. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to be chosen as one of the young people who benefited from Joe's guidance in my career. Um, here's the man of the hour up here. We've, we've heard a lot about biking uh, in the past day or so, but it was also hinted um, in the video yesterday that Joe is a man of many sports. And I know when I uh, first came, uh, or I met him here at KITP, that, that one of the things that really impressed me is here's a guy who lives in Southern California, but he plays hockey. What's cooler than that? Um, and so I know from experience living in Southern California for quite a while that it's really hard to get the hockey news down here. Um, and so I did want to take this opportunity to update you on a couple of recent scores <laughs> that you may have missed. OK, well, we'll come back to hockey later, maybe. I'm supposed to talk about physics. So I wanted to tell you about some work that I've been doing with a bunch of smart people here. There's Matt, who many of you know, and then a bunch of uh, students back at Perimeter. Uh, Jason's actually a Psy student, and he'll be here next year, so maybe he'll be Joe's next student. So let's start. Here's an idea. So here's the formula known as the Bekenstein Hawking formula, and we're all used to applying that to evaluating uh, the entropy of a black hole. But the suggestion here is that maybe it has broader applicability than that. Maybe we can think of that formula as being applied to any region of space-time and telling us about the entanglement of the degrees of freedom inside and outside of that region. And the proposal starts up there with in a theory of quantum gravity. So, well, here's a theory of quantum gravity. I'm, I'm told or I've heard that there are alternate pro approaches to quantum gravity. Uh, but this is Joe's party, and so we won't mention that today. We'll, we'll stick to this one. And the simple question I'm going to ask is, are there any observables, in particular boundary observables in this theory, that correspond to evaluating the Bekenstein-Hawking formula on various bulk surfaces in the interior? And of course, the answer is yes. You're all wondering. Uh, you know, there's what Ruin uh, or Shinsei and Tadashi taught us many years ago, that we, and we want to evaluate the entanglement entropy for various regions in the boundary of our ADS space. That corresponds to evaluating this well-known formula on various extremal surfaces in the interior. And as Juan was emphasizing yesterday, here what we're doing is we're applying that formula to very unusual or unconventional boundaries. We're not talking about black holes or horizons or even the boundaries of some causal domain. Well, that certainly indicates then that this formula has some kind of broader applicability than the black holes or the horizons that we we're used to thinking about. But are there more examples? And here, in fact, if we dig through the literature, there are some uh, speculations that evaluating this formula on various different kinds of surfaces tell us about uh, the entanglement in the boundary theory. And so one example here is causal holographic information by Veronica and Mukund. And I won't say more about it now. It may come up later if I have time. Um, there's also an intriguing idea by Vijay and friends. What they were thinking about was entanglement not in uh, position space, but entanglement in momentum space. And they were working with various examples, but in the context of holography, what they thought, or what they proposed, was that if I thought about a surface, say, at a fixed radius, and I evaluated this formula, I'm getting an entropy. What is that describing? Well, they suggested that it describes the entanglement between degrees of freedom at high scales and low scales in the boundary theory. That was an interesting proposal, but it's something that really has, uh, well, been made more quantitative, again, by Vijay and friends down here. And so that's really going to be the focus of my talk today. 
this idea of holographic space-time. And I, I really think this is an interesting paper, and that's the only archive number that you're going to see in this talk, because I encourage you all to go and read that paper, because as I tell this story, you will not know anything about what they said in their version of the story. So I'm going to back up, and I'm going to ask a central idea in the discussion here is an idea called strong subadditivity. And so it's a relation or an inequality that's satisfied by entanglement entropies when I've got various systems, or I'm considering various components of a system. In particular, in quantum field theory, we usually think about overlapping regions. And there's an interesting, or rather simple, proof that the Ru Takinagi proposal uh, in holography satisfies this inequality. And so here's a cartoon of the boundary of ADS space. I've got two regions that are overlapping. Um, and then in the bulk, I have these extremal surfaces. This one evaluates the entanglement entropy of region one. This one evaluates the entanglement entropy of region two. In the other side of the inequality, I have the intersection and the union. And so here are the extremal surfaces associated with those regions. How do I prove that those, or the areas up there, are less than the, the sum of the areas down here? Well, we simply reorganize how we do the accounting here. We add up this part of the area to that part, and this part of the area to that part. Then if I compare, say, the red curve, it's in the universe, or it's in the class of surfaces that I would have extremized over to determine the entanglement entropy for the union, but this is the extremal surface, so I know this has more area than that one. And similarly, we can take the yellow curve and we can compare it to the extremal surface for the intersection. And so what that tells us then is that, well, this inequality in the holographic context is satisfied. I also want to mention, though, that this is all done in a static situation. And Aaron at the back of the room here worked much harder uh, to establish a similar, uh, well, to establish the same inequality in a dynamical setting uh, in, in holography. OK, so what can I do with that? Well, we're going to go uh, back to the idea of holography. There, what I'm thinking about is ADS3 in global coordinates. So this is a Cauchy slice through ADS3. Here are my two boundary uh, intervals. And I'm just going to rewrite strong subadditivity in this way. I'm going to put the entanglement entropy for the intersection on this side. And so here I've got the entanglement entropy for the union. Um, to make life easier, I'm going to introduce some notation. We're going to see quantities or expressions like this, where I have entanglement entropies of intervals and then subtracting entanglement entropies of intersections. They're going to be finite sums. They're going to be infinite sums. Eventually, they're going to be integrals. So I want to name that rather than saying blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to call that combination the differential entropy. And so what this says is the, this entro entanglement entropy for the union is less than or equal to the differential entropy. Now, just as an observation, I can also see that the differential entropy bounds another quantity, namely the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy uh, evaluated on this red curve, which I'll call the outer envelope. It's the boundary of the union of all of the regions associated with those intervals on the, uh, in the boundary there. So that's just a curiosity. Uh, but it'll be a central uh, player in what I'm going, how I'm going to describe this. One of the observations is that I've written this as a function of the two intervals separately, not the union, because certainly if I change the partition there of, how, of the uh, boundary region without changing the union, I'm changing the details of that outer envelope or of that red curve. Um, now we're going to jump ahead. And rather than thinking about some uh, finite region or uh, small region on the boundary, I'm going to tile the entire boundary of my ADS space. And so here I have eight different intervals um, that cover the entire space. 
I can play the same strong subadditivity game, but apply it repeatedly in this case. And what I'll find is that strong subadditivity says that the entanglement entropy for the sum of all of the intervals, i.e., the entire boundary, is equal to this differential entropy constructed from the individual uh, or the partition of the boundary. Now, if I'm talking about pure ADS space, I'm talking about the vacuum of the CFT, or alternatively, if I'm talking about any pure state of the CFT, then in fact, I know that this side is zero. I see the whole state. It's a pure state. There is no entanglement left over. On the holographic side, the reason or the place that zero comes from is that I'm looking for an extremal surface that's homologous to the entire boundary. And so when I try and extremize, the surfaces all just shrink down to zero size. And so the area is zero. And so what I get here from strong subadditivity is that this differential entropy is a positive quantity. I can play the same game, however, of repeatedly applying various inequalities to consider this outer envelope, which now becomes a closed curve in the interior of my ADS3. And in this case, I'm not extremizing anything. And so what I end up with here is a finite quantity. I get the length of the curve over 4G, or the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of this red curve. And so that says that the differential uh, entropy here actually is bigger than some positive number, uh, rather than just bigger than zero. Now, what's the clever thing that Vijay and his friends did? Well, they thought about a particular continuum limit, in quotes. What they did is they kept the length of the intervals finite, but then took an infinite number of them, densely packing the boundary uh, with those intervals. And in that particular case, this outer envelope becomes a smooth circle of some fixed radius. The real surprise was that in this particular case, the differential entropy that you build up, in fact, saturates that inequality. And so what I get here is precisely the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of this circle. So we're recovering that uh, gravitational entropy in terms of this thing in the boundary theory that I'm calling the differential entropy. In fact, they went on to embellish that construction by allowing the sizes of the intervals to change as you move around the boundary in a continuous way. You could build up the outer envelope. To well, the, the outer envelope was, again, a smooth curve, but it's some, it, you could build up some wobbly curve that had all sorts of structure. Again, the interesting thing was that in this continuum limit, this inequality was saturated. And so the differential entropy on the boundary theory was giving you precisely the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy in the bulk. So armed with that perspective, it's straightforward to think about this problem now in higher dimensions. And so this is just a first step in that direction. What I'm going to do is I'm going to think about a higher dimensional boundary, but I'm going to tile it with strips or intervals. And so I could be this room. We're just slicing it up with walls, um, which overlap. They have a finite width, and there's various overlaps, as I've drawn here. In the bulk, there's various extremal surfaces describing the entropy of the various intervals, and then other extremal surfaces associated with the intersections. The outer envelope is this red curve, or this red surface now, down at the bottom. And we're going to evaluate the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy on that particular surface. Now, again, it's straightforward just to apply this construction, take this continuum limit. And the remarkable thing is that, once again, this geometric inequality is saturated, so that what I'm seeing in this higher dimensional example is, again, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy for some smooth curve in the bulk is equal to the differential entropy in the boundary. Of course, I want to emphasize this is the simplest possible thing I could do in higher dimensions. These curves can wave up and down, but there is this planar symmetry. It's not a function of more than one direction. It's just a, uh, it can go up and down, but it's, it's just a function of this one direction x that runs orthogonal to all of the strips. 
So far, we're in empty ADS, yeah. And I have lots of time so I can uh, talk about causal holographic information. So this, I, well, so far, I haven't described any of the details of any of the calculations. Um, and so you might be thinking, well, this will work for any old loops in ADS space. Um, and so here's another clever set of loops, namely the ones associated with causal holographic information. Here we look at the causal development of some interval in the boundary, and then we send light sheets out into the bulk, and that defines something that's uh, known as the bulk causal wedge. The causal, or, or there's an extremal surface there, and so the causal holographic information is just the area of that extremal surface over 4G. This, I, I didn't really emphasize it, but there was this story about observers and finite times uh, in Vijay's original version of this discussion. And so this might have been thought to be the natural way to extend that discussion to higher dimensions. However, unfortunately, when we just apply the, the standard, uh, well, differential form, uh, that we had for the entanglement entropies to this causal holographic information. In this particular case, we don't find uh, that there's some kind of nice inequality that's now saturated. In fact, what you find is that uh, there's a quantity over here that depends on the cutoff. And so if that cutoff goes to zero, this particular quantity is going to diverge. And that's simple to understand. It's because... Um, the, well, there's a leading area law divergence that's common to this and common to the entanglement entropy for a given interval. But the subleading divergences in the causal holographic information are non-local. And so they care about the entire uh, interval or the entire region that we're studying here. Um, and so the, when we take the various differences in this expression here, those subleading divergences don't cancel. That contrasts with the extremal surface that tells us about the entanglement entropy. In that particular case, there's the area law. And then all of the subleading divergences also have a local interpretation on the various, uh, well, on the entangling surface, uh, defining the various regions. And so in that difference, those local uh, contributions all cancel out. So that's one place where it doesn't work. But then there's a list of places where, in fact, this does work. One of my favorite things is to think about higher curvature gravity. And so there's a simple example uh, known as Gauss-Binet gravity. That's a case where you're introducing R squared in the action. And it turns out you have to add a curvature correction to the gravitational entropy formula. Um, but basically, all you do is you substitute uh, this expression for the Bekenstein-Hawking uh, formula here. And then that's the extension that gives you the entanglement entropy in the boundary theory. Again, what you find going through this procedure is that the differential entropy, where these entanglement entropies are defined this way, now give us the appropriate gravitational entropy evaluated on our bulk surface. Yeah? I'm a little lost. So you have this potential generalization to higher Yeah. Then you started talking about boundaries of causal Right. 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 So I just tried this. Well, for various reasons, it doesn't work. Now I'm going back to entanglement entropies. Uh, this is an example where that. Uh, well, this is a, just an extension of the root Takinagi, but we're playing the same game now for a slightly different theory of gravity in the bulk. So, and, and what I find is the same thing hap Well, no, no, OK, you said area. So the thing I'm evaluating now is not quite the area, but this expression, which is natural to associate with the gravitational entropy of a black hole horizon or any other surface. And so this is our differential entropy in the boundary theory, and this is our gravitational entropy evaluated on this bulk surface. There was a question about ADS. We can think about going beyond ADS, thinking about more general metrics. In fact, ADS was an essential, uh, and, and you can reproduce the same kind of expressions. 
um, you can also think about time-dependent surfaces, and those work as well. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to draw nice pictures. Uh, but the salient lessons, or this is an interesting case because there's some, in, uh, some important lessons that one learns. In this case, the bulk surface is wandering around up and down, not just in the z direction, but in the time direction. And so you might ask, well, what's the boundary data that I need? Well, the boundary data is really just a family of intervals that are associated with that bulk surface in an interesting way. How do you define those intervals? Well, they're going to be defined by the endpoints. And so there are two curves, two independent, in quotes, curves or surfaces in the boundary that are defi defining, say, uh, there's a typo there, defining the left side of the intervals and the right side of these intervals. And lambda is some parameter that takes us through this family of intervals. One simple way to define that family, given the bulk surface, is that you simply take an extremal surface for our holographic uh, entanglement entropy, which is tangent to each point in the bulk surface, and it'll come out and define these endpoints uh, in the boundary. So it, it seems that this is a very general uh, feature. And there, there ought to be a, um, a simpler way or a, a way which captures uh, the great generality with which I'm saying that this idea applies, namely that I get the, bulk, uh, the gravitational entropy on a bulk surface in terms of this differential entropy in the boundary theory. And so we're going to step back from holography, and we're going to think about classical mechanics. In particular, let's think about a... Uh, Lagrangian with some uh, coordinates and the velocities where s is some uh, dummy time variable. I'm going to evaluate the action on shell, and so there's uh, various initial conditions and final conditions uh, associated with a particular trajectory. And then I'm going to think about varying those boundary conditions. And so something that we can look up is that the variation of the on shell action has these endpoint contributions here, depending on the variations in the, the, the initial and final time and the variations in the initial and final uh, positions. And then there's this bulk contribution that's proportional to the equations of motion. But I said I was looking at the on-shell action, and so that part goes away, and we're just left with the endpoints. Now, inspired by what we're doing or where I'm going to apply this, let's think about taking a family of initial and final conditions parameterized by some other lambda. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a loop in these spaces, and I'm going to integrate over that loop. This is just an exact differential, and so when I integrate that, I get 0. And on this side now, I've got an integral of all of this endpoint data, or these variations. But what it's telling me is that stuff at one end, the initial conditions, uh, sorry, here are the initial conditions, stuff at one end of the interval is related to stuff at the other after I do this averaging over the family of uh, curves. So let's think about that in terms of our entropy problem. There, we've got some kind of entropy functional, but what we do is we're supposed to extremize it. We treat it like an action. And so I'm going to apply that lemma and my endpoint data that I'm going to use is for the initial conditions, I'll just think about, say, the left endpoint of my various intervals in the family uh, in the boundary. The variations I'm going to make are just, well, the boundary conditions are that that's going to define the initial time, s equals 0. They're always going to be at the boundary. And then there's some parameters here or it's some curve that defines the left endpoints of all of my intervals. I'm going to evaluate the action then only on a piece of my extremal surface, and I'm going to evaluate it down to this point where the curve, the extremal surface is tangent to my bulk surface. So the bulk surface is defined here. It's parameterized by lambda, and it's some curve that wanders around in the bulk space like that. And so there's some uh, endpoint data that I'm going to plug in uh, or into my action to evaluate things along the blue part of the curve here. 
Now, I'm going to use that uh, lemma that I had on the last transparency. I'm also going to use the reparameterization invariance of the entropy functional. And what we find at the end of the day is an expression like this. Here I'm evaluating my Lagrangian on the bulk curve, and I'm integrating over uh, that surface. On the other side, coming from the other end of the curves, what I've got here is the derivative of my on-shell action with respect to uh, the variations uh, well, of this curve, that endpoint curve, again, integrated over uh, the family of curves. And so this really is the gravitational entropy. This is the thing that I use to define the, uh, the entropy on surfaces. What this is, with a little bit of thought, is precisely this quantity, the differential entropy. It's the differences well, the, the differences that I was talking about before really reduce in the continuum limit to this differential entropy. But the way we've set the problem up, uh, this equality now applies for very general surfaces that are wandering around in the bulk and very general backgrounds that depend not just in Z in, interest, Z in interesting ways, but also on the time and the X parameter in, in principle. All, of the, all the background has to respect is this planar symmetry. I've also got only first derivatives here, but that includes, in fact, the action for a whole raft of different theories, not just Einstein gravity, but, in fact, all of the Lovelock theories uh, fall into that class. And so this is then a proof that has, well, shows that this uh, equality between this boundary thing and that bulk thing applies in very great generality. Um, then I'm about to close, so there's a bunch of questions one can ask. My first question is, given that construction that I just gave you, why are we only thinking about entanglement entropy? In fact, there are a lot of holographic probes that, at least the leading order in, in some large N expansion, involve extremizing some bulk area, and so I should be able to apply the same construction. So, for example, if I'm thinking about two-point correlators of some high-dimension operator, that involves looking at the geodesic, geodesic length between uh, points in the boundary. And so a similar construction would allow me to reconstruct the length of some curve in the bulk here in terms of some differential, uh, well, some expression like this in terms of a family of two-point functions. Um, there's other various questions up here about, well, how do I know that my boundary or these boundary curves are def really defining in a consistent way some bulk surface in the ADS or in my general background? Uh, if I don't have uh, those consistency conditions satisfied, then what am I really evaluating with the differential entropy? I've limited the discussion so far just to planar symmetry. Of course, you'd like to do more interesting things. Uh, and that's going to require uh, some thought as well. Um, here are some slogans, and you can read those online. Um, I'd like to turn to Joe now and, and wish him uh, a happy 60th, even though I'm told he's not quite 60. Uh, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for the patience, the, uh, the advice, uh, the generosity that you've shown me uh, over my career. And so I have some mementos uh, to, to uh, thank you with. And so the first here is a uh, regulation PI cap to <laughs> protect your uh, neurons from that brutal Southern California sun. I'm told by, I was instructed or taught by Jim that whenever I go to lunch, I have to wear a hat. Uh, otherwise, that will lead to problems. The other is, given your interests, um, I bring you this uh, handcrafted pointer from the Perimeter Institute. Um, and I figured if you don't want to use it as a pointer, you might be able to find something else to do with it. Um, however, like any technology device, it has certain instructions labeled on the side here. And so I'll read. It says, please return to Gravity Room, Perimeter Institute. <laughs> so, so that's your standing invitation to uh, come visit us whenever you want. Uh, the hockey games are 7 o'clock Monday mornings. Uh, but I'm told by Greg, Greg's our outreach guy, that I should warn you, it's full gear. Uh, <laughs> Greg's way too serious about his hockey. But thank you. Thank you. Oh.
<laughs> Questions for Rob or? By the way, did I mention those hockey scores? <laughs> So, so you had this limiting procedure where you, um, you know, take an infinite number of intervals, and for a general curve, you had to vary the, the width of them. Right. Is that decomposition unique? So that given one of your curves or surfaces with planar symmetry, there's only one way to, or is the answer un independent of how you um, might construct it by, you know, so, these so, infinite intervals? Uh, so I haven't proven it. My intuition would be that it is unique. However, th there's an interesting question when you start to think about, uh, you know, I've, I've restricted myself to these planar cases with planar symmetry, but I think there, is, there, there becomes an interesting question when you start tiling things with finite regions that you might be able to reconstruct the same surface in many different ways. Um, but I'm, I'm just far from understanding that situation at this point in time. But, but there is some kind of interesting question there about uniqueness in that, in that case. Actually, this might be the same question in another guise. Your differential entropy formula looks like the beginning of an inclusion-exclusion formula. And I wonder about the missing terms. Should you have uh, plus the entropy of threefold intersections minus entropy? Of ah, okay. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, one of the things. So, so I don't have a complete answer. The, the, one of the things, though, that you, you you might note about this construction is that even when you have just intervals that are are uh, you know arranged linearly, uh, any one interval overlaps with many others. But we've, we've designated a sort of ordering to them, and we're only looking at the intersection between mm. next nearest neighbors. However, you can't avoid, in, again, in higher dimensions, there's, there, well, what one has to reconsider what you're going to use as the differential entropy when you go to higher dimensions. I, I don't actually, I've only played with it a little bit. I don't actually think that you're going to require an infinite sequence of various kinds of intersections, um, at least if you're doing this tiling in, in some systematic way. But I'll, I'll, I'll agree that there's an open question there. About that's, well, that is going to be at the heart of how do you extend the, the differential entropy in this particular case. Thank you. So I understand you've generalized the, the work of Vijay and Bartek yeah. and, and others uh, to the case where the curves are, are moving up and down in time in the bulk. Is, yeah. that, is that correct? And you've also generalized it to higher dimensional settings with slabs. Yeah. Uh, ha in those higher dimensional settings, are you also able to, to have uh, motion in time in the bulk? Sure. Can you take a null limit of, of, the, uh, of the bulk surface? That's an interesting question. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. So far, this is all in the vacuum solution, right? Uh, no, when, we, when we've gone here, the, the, the back, well, again, we, we've gone away from ADS. We don't need to be talking about ADS. Uh, but the, the background can depend on uh, your x and your t, as well as the, the, z, the radial coordinate. So, so in this particular context, uh, you could think about excited states, if you like. Uh, I guess it's a question about VJ at all work, but uh, can one attack this problem in one plus one dimensional CFT without using ADS3, but, but just somehow, because a lot is known, right, about... Uh, VJ is dying to say something. Oh. No? I'm not dying to say something. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. Since it's a question about your work, uh -huh. I... So as far as uh, uh, doing a construction one plus one dimensional CFT, of course, uh, if you're computing the differential entropy from entanglement entropies, the formula is explicitly known. So you don't need to use Ryu Takanagi in any way right. to compute any of this. So in so one you plus can one, see this bound and stuff. Well, uh, it's a, the formulae are the same, right? The numbers you're going to get are the same, so you'll get this bound. The deeper meaning of this bound is not, I think, completely clear. So we were trying to uh, so give some meaning to the bound by saying that the right-hand side of the subadditivity bound had something to do 
with the uncertainty left over regarding the entanglement of the wave function after you make all finite time measurements of all observers. And that's what that interpretation is somewhat called into question by Rob's slide about the uh, causal holographic inter, uh, information. But, it, but, the, but the meaning of the bound, I think, is not yet entirely clear. Let me also add, Rob's proof is going to need some extension, I think, because if you consider the simplest class of interesting excited states in ADS3, namely the conical defect space times, and you use the minimal geodesics of Ryu and Takenagi, you'll find that there's a maximum depth to which they penetrate in ADS, so that leaves a hole out in the middle. What we've found is that uh, you can cover even the interior by using the non-minimal geodesics, there are, because in these space times there are longer geodesics, and that these exactly measure the entanglement of fractionated freedom in the dual D1, D5 CFT, which you'll recall there's a long string sector there where the momenta are quantized in fractional units, and we are used to thinking of entanglement entropy as entanglement between spatial regions, but of course it doesn't have to be. It can be in momentum space, or indeed it can be between fractionated degrees of freedom, uh, which are only some of the degrees of freedom at a given location. So, um, so I think the formula you're talking about require extension to this kind of fractionated differential entropy. And so we have some results that will come out in the paper shortly. And I think your, uh, but your, I think your results, Rob, can be your explicit proof I think can be easily extended to even account for those things. So I think it's going to go through. Okay. Further questions? Uh, yeah, I just had a very naive question. So is the connection clear to uh, this kind of entropy to the usual entropy we count for black holes, like if I take a Strominger Waffa kind of counting of the entropy, just a number of microstates. And that, uh, there's an area there also. And then there's an area here. And then we also have the kind of entropy that we heard about from Busso yesterday. Uh, is it clear what's the relation between all these, or there's something not completely clear? To be fair, it's probably not completely clear. I would have said in the black hole case that the kind of entropy I'm talking about is the same as the kind of entropy you would like to talk about. In Raphael's case, what he was doing was, uh, well, one of the things he talked about was that in quantum mechanics or in quantum field theory, there's these uh, divergent boundary terms or, or uh, the contributions to the short range entanglement near the entangling surface uh, is UV divergent. Um, so this proposal is saying essentially that quantum gravity is going to regulate those particular contributions. Uh, that he was canceling by doing this subtraction with the Cassini entropy. More questions? If not, let's thank Rob. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Can, sorry. One more. Actually, I'll ask this. So, in, in general, for higher derivative gravities, we don't know whether the holographic proposal satisfies strong subadditivity. Sure. Right. So, the combination you, you motivated was motivated by strong subadditivity. And I understand the variational argument gives you an interesting saturation. But if you didn't know what function, that, a, that your functional satisfied strong subadditivity, would you have picked this combination? So what, what motivates this combination in general? You, you mean that formula in the middle of the transparency there? Uh, so, so as you know, the, the historical route that brought you there was through strong subadditivity. At the end of the day, though, what I'm writing down is just some differential formula that now doesn't, well, I tried to advertise that you don't even have to be thinking about entropy anymore. And so it's just an interesting probe where variations of scale in the boundary are probing, you know, the, the bulk at different scales. And so uh, I don't, well, I, as VJ was also saying, you know, the, the real meaning behind that differential entropy is really an open question still. Uh, but I don't think you necessarily have to think about strong subadditivity. But, uh, but you, you could wonder whether you could turn this around and go further to ask whether strong subadditivity results can be proved in higher derivative theories. Oh, you might, yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, the, the construction I gave, though, was, uh, 
well, we were just doing simple classical mechanics where you only had first derivatives. And that's a special property of this special class of Lovelock theories. In general, if I'm thinking about a random higher derivative theory, I'm going to have higher, well, I'm going to have lots of higher derivatives. I probably want to recast the whole discussion in terms of a perturbative construction then. And, well, I just haven't thought about that at this point. If there are no further questions, let's thank Rob again. And we reconvene at 11 a.m. <laughs>